Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Impact Review, February 7th. Yeah baby. Now, what did we get in this Impact Review? Did we get some stuff done well in Manchester, England? This is what I'm about to tell you. Now, I was actually quite surprised. Seriously surprised about a few things that were done here and a few things that were not. Now, first thing, AJ Styles. They did a small video segment of AJ there, but he wasn't there. Why? Why would you mention someone in a country where seeing the person there is just as important as even hearing about them? And the thing here is this. You got AJ Styles, who has not been seen in months, having a video package on a show that's in England where he's not even there. Now, if he appeared during the night, I didn't see him. Tell me below if you saw him, because I didn't see him. So I'm wondering, what the hell was the point of showing him? You could have done that when you went back to the United States. If he's not with you on the road in Manchester, England, what was the point of doing that? I don't see the point of it. I really felt that was a waste of at least a minute or two of time they could have devoted to something else. Now, understand what they did about Jeff Hardy. They had to show the reason why he wasn't there. Now, it would have been better to actually have a video package of him talking, saying, don't worry, my creatures, don't worry, I'm coming back. I'm going to get them for what they did. That would have been more effective. That could have been done from AJ's time. That little package would have been better than the AJ package. So I don't understand the reason for that. I was quite surprised that was even thrown in there. Now... Next, in the opening of the show, we got Aces and Eights, which I felt was terrible. It was effective. It was necessary to get the two people who now joined over. And I believe, and I'm saying this very clearly, the only ones that are left now are seven. I do not believe we're going to see the other Aces and Eights like Armbreaker and stuff like, well, actually, Armbreaker is Mike Knox. But Mike Knox is there. Doc is there. The VP is there. You have... Devon, you have Mr. Anderson, and now the heel twins, Garrett and Wes. I'm calling them the heel twins because they're going to be inseparable. They got nothing else to do with them. This is the only option they got. So they had to put these two over. Was it effective? It was effective because it was for the storyline. You needed it for that. Did I enjoy it? No. I did not need to hear Garrett talk. I didn't mind too much of... Wes, because we don't hear Wes often. He barely talks. Except when it was with Kurt Angle. But you know what? For that segment, I'd rather have heard Wes talk, Wes Briscoe, than Garrett. Because Garrett was boring. I didn't like it. Wes was at least something. And you hearing Wes say, you know what, Hogan? I've been calling for two years and then you finally decide to let me in? And the one who gave you your first boots to get in this business was my father? Are you kidding me? No. I did it because I wanted to. Because you deserved it. That I didn't mind. He sounded very choppy to me. I think this was maybe a little bit... Hmm. I really believe he needs more practice on the mic. He's never had any real mic practice. If it was an OVW, he didn't get enough mic practice. He needs some. If he's going to be seen more, he needs some more mic work. So the next thing we saw was X Division. Mm. Now I thought two things with this. One is that if Rob does not job here, they're not going to go anywhere with the X Division. And two, if Rob did not win, who would win? The person I thought had to be Zima Ion. Now, it doesn't mean I'm a Zima, Zima Ion fan. I don't like, don't mind Zima Ion. I think he's a good talent. I don't hate him. I do like him. But the person between those two who are better is Kenny King, baby. Lonely the King, baby. He presented himself well, but I didn't expect him to win. If it wasn't going to be no job Rob, because we know now that he did not job, it should have been Zima Ion because if Jesse Sorensen, and I still haven't heard anyone say Jesse isn't coming back. Tell me below anybody if you believe Jesse is not coming back. If you heard any rumors or something that he's just too badly injured to return or he decided not to come back 
because he had a better type of, um, he had a better offer somewhere else. Give me a comment if you know anything. If he hasn't, that means he's coming back. You need to get Zima Ion ready because if you don't, the storyline between them will be a loss. And that is the most epic storyline you can see. That is a true underdog story. Zima Ion breaking the neck of Jesse Sorensen over almost a year or so ago. Coming back to get back at Ion and then going through the X Division becoming champion, winning the title from Zima Ion, or going through Zima Ion to become champion. You need this TNA. You know you need this TNA. Baby, we need this, folks. If you don't agree with me that Zima Ion must be started, must start to be pushed. He must get a better character. He must get more TV time, particularly when Jesse comes back. If he's still not scheduled to come back, I can understand that, but it's better to get him structured now. It could take months before he really looks viable that people will get invested in hating him really badly because he's nothing but a jobber now. Unless he has a credible heel, real heel presence, you don't got nothing. But job Rob, no job Rob did not do the job here. So it's a possibility Jesse's he's still not coming back. And if they do do this, that he does not lose the title, no job, Rob. And Jesse Sorensen comes back and they do not, and they do not, and this is upsetting, that's why I'm, I'm botching a little bit. They do not structure Ion quat. It's upsetting to think that Ion is not getting structured. So when Jesse comes back, it's nothing. It would be stupid if they did this. Now, um, the next thing is, you know what? I'm going to get this done. I've done two videos on my, um, I believe it was my mixed bag of wrestling. Two videos for the British boot camp. I did episode one that I saw and episode two and I saw episode three and four. I have not seen the final episodes of British boot camp where Rockstar Spud was finally declared the winner of it. They showed the segment in the ring and they showed a video package before the segment in the ring. Now, the video package was quite nice. It wasn't bad. And this gave American folk who have not been seeing the product of England what they got. It's no better than Tough Enough. This could actually make it interesting for Americans to want a Tough Enough type of reality show. This could actually be the catalyst for it. Because in England, it was short, yeah. I don't think there was more than five or six episodes. I don't think there was that many episodes. But essentially... Whatever episodes they have, they're probably more than that, but whatever episodes they're actually seeing or they actually have, Rockstar Spud has now won. Now, when he finally came into the ring and went with Jerry, Jeremy, JB, he didn't do too badly. He spoke well and eloquent. I was not bored with it, but I was actually surprised to see our enhanced jobber, our local enhanced jobber, Robbie E. This is the only time I like to see Robbie E. He helped Joseph Park to get over when he was already over, but really got over. Now he's helping out Rockstar Spud. This is what they used to do back in the 70s and the 80s. Have Pacific people there that could talk pretty well, could wrestle pretty well, but will job for you when you need them. This is what Robbie E has become. And I have no problem with that. I don't want him to be pushed into the... X Division. I don't want him to be pushed into television title. I don't want him in the tag team titles. Leave him where he does the best work. There's no shame in it, ladies and gentlemen. Look, I'm going to say this clearly for Americans particular. There are people that have abilities and there are people who have abilities beyond them. There's always going to be someone who has abilities more than you anywhere in the world, including the United States. But people believe in the United States that you must go for the brass ring, forget about getting the lower thing, even if it means sticking with that for a very long period of time. If you can't get anything or get what you really want. The problem that a lot of Americans believe is that they must get the biggest and most greatest job or they get health care and welfare if they believe they can't do anything or maybe they can get away with it. I'm not saying every American is like that. I'm an American. I'm injured at this time. I can't really work. I'm stuck at the ladder. I used to work. I worked 
15 straight years of my life, I worked very hard for whatever money I got. But putting this story together is simple. There are some people who are meant to go far. And some people who want to go farther. But either they can't do it or they don't want to do it. The people who can go far, really far, who can do it or just don't know they can do it, that's what we got for our main event. The ones who can't go very far or who do not want to go very far is where Robbie E is. I'm not saying that Robbie E, when he isn't in his character, doesn't care about the business. I'm not saying that, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think I'm being stupid and disrespectful. I'm not. But I'm giving it to you like this. It's obvious that people are not over for Robbie E. They're not. He's stuck with the same character constantly. If he has ability going beyond that, he can't do it because the brass in the back four, TNA won't let him do it. Or they believe that he just doesn't have that ability. Or maybe he doesn't want to go farther than that. He's fine where he is. We don't know the whole story. But put him somewhere where he can do the most good. They tried pushing him in the X Division. Didn't go anywhere with Jay Lethal. They pushed him in the world title scene. That didn't get any farther either. So now he's an enhanced jobber. Which he does very well with. Look what happened with Joseph Park. And with Rockstar Spud, the people in Manchester screamed their heads off. There was not much or almost no can heat. There was no need to. If you saw when they panned the entire arena, that arena was packed, baby. That's how I want to see it. That is how I want to see TNA get their people in. I've said it before and I'm saying it again. And I agree with other people who do these videos. They say when they go into the UK, you can feel the big game. In other words, you can feel like a main event quality show every time, even if it's not that good. It's because the crowd makes it big quality. That's what I say. I agree with them. And that's the way it's supposed to be. They didn't have a match. But the thing I like the most is that Robbie E got screwed over by Robbie T. Not saying this is a teaser that he's going to leave him. I would be glad if Robbie T worked with Rockstar Spud. Really, I wouldn't mind seeing two Brits together again. Look at look at the um, British Invasion. Before they really buried it, it didn't it didn't do that badly. It actually got over to a point. It did. So I wouldn't mind seeing Rockstar Spud and Robbie T together. You got Robbie T here and you got Rockstar Spud. They literally, where my hands are, is literally the differences in height and size. Robbie T was like not his daddy. But basically a mountain compared to him like a molehill. That's how small Rockstar Spud is. And that doesn't mean Rockstar Spud can't be great in X Division. He's a small man who can move fast. And he knocked the shit out of Robbie E. So it's a chance that the next impact you're going to have those two facing each other. I have no problem with it. Leave this the way it is. Leave Robbie E as a jobber. Please, TNA, leave him as a jobber. If he has to come on every week to help someone who's new, who has great potential to get over, and Robbie E speaks well enough that he doesn't bore everyone, I wouldn't mind seeing him every single day on Impact as long as he does it properly. Now, sorry it took so long. That was a bit long. <laughs> um, the Austin Aries and Robbie Roode Segment and match. I like the backstage segment where they're saying that we're going to be on the same page. We're going to put our egos. We're going to shelf them. We're going to do what we do. And they still kind of kicked each other around with their egos. I love when they do this kind of stuff. Now, the match itself between Chavo, Superman, and them uh, wasn't a great match. But it's not meant to be a great match. It was meant to finally let them finally win. And now, as people call them... Those stereotypicals have lost. Of course, they're going to get their rematch, but it's not the point. I call them the iconic ones. The it factor and the greatest men that ever lived. I could have called them like everybody else, but I call them iconic because they are an iconic tag team. They bring a wow factor. They do. Then they bring... The greatest wrestling from two of the greatest men to ever live, Austin Aries and Robert Wood. 
the greatest men that ever lived, the iconic tag team, ladies and gentlemen. We finally got them. But you know what the strangest thing was? And I believe it was the Slag Daddy that said this. The people were split between Chavo and Austin Aries at one point. Maybe they need to switch these two from heels into faces because I think really the crowd will want them as faces. Even if they still have that attitude where they're the odd couple, it looks like it may get over like Hell No did in the very beginning. Hell No right now sucks. I have not seen SmackDown yet. I have been busy this entire week. Yes, I put up a couple of videos that were unrelated to wrestling. I had recorded them several days before. But this really... I have not seen what's going to happen with SmackDown, and I will be doing a video on that. If it's not today, it will be tomorrow, but taking away from that, they are going to be over like Hell No was. If they switch from heels to faces, it would actually work. Now, what do we got? The... Okay. When I saw Jesse with Brooke Hogan and Tara, and I'm going to say something about Tara and what happened with Tess Marker in a few minutes. But when I saw that, I thought, are they going to have Jesse have a match with someone? I thought at that time it was going to be with pretty much Robbie E. Because they had a little conflict, but never nothing really happened. But when I saw... When I saw James Storm, really, I felt really angry. I felt really sad at the same time and angry. I felt sad for James Storm that he now... It has nothing to do, period. And he has to work with Jesse. And Jesse made his nose bleed. And the match itself was so-so. But the thing that got me is at the very end of the match, you saw that James Stone was actually legitimately pissed that he got his nose bled by Jesse because he was sloppy. And he literally hit him kind of hard on purpose and at the end making fun of him saying well how you feel I'm sorry about your damn luck and then threw his face to the ground I felt that he legitimately did that as a shoot he really felt legitimately mad because Jesse messed up his face and do I blame him no this is why I get angry they got nothing for him to do why couldn't he be working with who couldn't they have done something with Daniels with him? Again, at least something would be going on. Couldn't they have done something else with him? Maybe have him go after Aces and Eight. I know you're saying, what? Look, I'd rather have him on a storyline that's being pushed, even if it sucks, than working with Lily, the bottom of the totem pole guy, doing absolutely nothing. He's not an enhanced jobber like Robbie E is. What was the point of this match for James Storm? I was mad as hell. And when Dick Storm shows up on the Impact Review of the Off The Rope Show, I say this to you, my man, Mr. Storm, Mr. Robert Storm, my man. If you feel angry and disenfranchised at TNA, I'm telling you, I agree with you. Mr. Dick Storm, please take my humble apologies as a fan of your cousin i do the apologies for one reason only that the company that i do care very much about is treating your cousin like shit and you deserve better and so does your cousin deserve better than this now if you believe i'm wrong i don't mind being told my son shut up you're wrong but if i am agreed with I thank you for your thoughts. Now, getting that done. <laughs> um, what we have with going on to the next part. Tara, Miss Tess Mocker. It felt so like it, it was random. That's pretty much it. We know Velvet lost last week. Nothing happened. We all expected Velvet to win the, the title then. She didn't win it. Nothing happened. So having Test Mocker again, what did it give us? I'll tell you what it gave us. It gave us a very strange lesbian type of attitude. Now, 
The thing about this is this. And I know you're going to say, what do you mean strange lesbian? Here I go. Maybe someone else notices next to myself. I could be wrong. One, when the segment happened with Brooke, Tara, and Jesse, I thought at first seeing Tara in that really tight black shirt, I'm not saying Tara is an extremely large chested woman. She's not. Maybe a 38C, maybe near D. But with that shirt on, it kind of, I'm wondering, wait a minute. If it's me, at that moment, is it me or is Tara's titties bigger than normal? Did she have a breast implant or something? That's how I felt. And then during that match, something started keeping creeping in. Like these two, Miss Tessmacher and Tara, kind of missed one another. It wasn't the fact that the match was a bit physical in the way I will tell you in a second. But it was the fact that the way Tara wore her clothes and then went down to the ring in a shirt, like something that two lesbians would have together. Like, baby, I'm coming to bed now. She's wearing just a t-shirt or just a flannel shirt to come to her lady and took that sucker off just to show her, I'm really interested in you, honey. And then when the match was going on, when Tara took Miss Tessmacher and swung her around her head to give her a nice, almost like, um. A black hole slam somewhat her version of it miss test marker went and grabbed at her titties not just go across them she started grabbing those suckers she started grabbing like mm, I just have to grab your titties just a little bit baby I'm sorry I, I missed them so much because we're not able to do this on screen anymore I just have to do it and she did now you would say, man, you're really horny. I could say that, but then there was something more. By the time they were nearing the end of the match, and when Miss Tessmacher was in a headlock and she's trying to stand up, if you look at her crotch, because they did a very tight, well, not all the way up into your face type shot, but you can see her crotch as she's standing up. You can see a little poke here, like this, through her clothes, like that. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what that is, that was her lovely, beautiful clit. Normally, if you see her in a shot like that, you don't normally see it. But in this case, you could see it fully erect or enlarged as a woman would have it. And understand, gentlemen, if you don't know that women's clitoris is grow and engorge like a man's penis you now know that it does grow and at the end what do we get after that scene of what I just saw about her clit we got the pee punch ladies ladies and gentlemen the pussy punch from Miss Tessmacher to the face of Tara and you can see that she wasn't doing that pussy punch very far away she was doing it literally to her face if no one didn't notice how close Tara's face, it was like this. And she was slightly going like this, but she wanted her really close to sniff the hell out of her. Yes, Tara won. And the match really didn't, didn't really do anything. There's nothing hyped for what's going to happen in lockdown. I don't see nothing there, but that wasn't the point of this match for us. This is the point that two women who have missed each other so much because they're not tag team partners, ladies and gentlemen, wanted to show the world how much they miss each other. Oh my goodness. Please tell me if I'm just out of my mind. Please tell me, leave a comment. I'm begging someone to leave me a comment below if you saw the things I saw. Because literally, the way this match went down, it looks like they were just trying to show each other affection, sexually. <laughs> I, I, I'm moving on now. Now, I went a little far with this one. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The final thing here is this. Bully Ray, Sting, and the Aces and Eights, Doc and Devon. This was not dramatic. This was not metal dramatic. It felt empty. It was good to see the faces get over the heels, but the heels are too weak. And then with Mike Knox coming in, trying to do the save, and then getting his ass kicked out of the ring, it made it worse. And by the end of it, when Devon got driven through the table, and then you see 
during that match, right before Devon got driven through the table, you see Bully Ray all painted up, hulking up. The crowd ate it up, which gave it points for me personally. It was seeing the crowd highly excited about it. Now, I'm not saying that Can Heat wasn't still pumped in there. But if you're going by 100% of canned heat, I say about 30% of it was canned heat. If any at all, I'm going to be honest about it. You could see in the background of people cheering, waving, yelling. You could see them. The crowd was into this. It was still an effective segment. To me, it felt boring because we don't have strong heels going into this. We don't. And that's where the problem lies, ladies and gentlemen. This was not dramatic enough. Yeah, at the end, finally Hulk Hogan appreciates his son-in-law. And you hear before the match started that when they did their segment and Hulk Hogan says, I'm hoping you'll show me you're a good man. And Bully Ray says, I'm not a good man, I'm a bad man. And at the end of this, going back to it, seeing how they act, there was no reason to have the original segment. Because Bully Ray acted like a face completely. There was no real heel type of attitude from him. I didn't feel it and I didn't see it. And saying this clearly about this impact. And I'm going to make sure I don't forget anything because um, our um, British boot camp, I did say Jesse and... Austin Aries, yeah, I said everything I need to say, and this was a C-plus show. It was. It was highly effective in the sense that you needed to continue storylines. You needed to. So that's what they did. But was it good storytelling? No. I'm happy that the iconic ones, Rude and Aries, won their titles. I'm not happy that Zima Ion did not win the X Division Championship. They need to get him ready for Jesse. They ain't happening. Brooke, Tessmacher, and Tara, the lesbian thing, I loved it, but there was nothing there for the match and the storyline for Tara at all for her championship. Nothing. The Rockstar Spud segment was good and effective and hopefully will lead into a match next week, which we need for Rockstar Spud and our resident jobber, Robbie E. It's necessary. And the final match was highly, was just for me empty. Tell me if you felt it was really great storytelling, if it made you moved, if it made you feel happy. I don't mind hearing it. Maybe I'll go back and reevaluate it again so I can try and get a better perspective. Because sometimes you need to get a better perspective on things if you want to understand what you're looking at. So it's a C-plus show, and I hope you enjoyed the Zane View of Impact February 7th. Subscribe and comment to Zane View. I will be getting my SmackDown review done as soon as possible. I got somewhere to go right now, but hopefully I'll get it done before tonight, and if not tomorrow. Have a good day, ladies and gentlemen.